Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will actually uh, tell you how to construct this quotient algebras from the ideals. Okay, let us start. Let us uh, fix this uh, Lie algebra G. Lie algebra over complex numbers. Okay. So, before actually uh, getting into the definition of ideals, so I would like to first uh, motivate uh, the notion of ideals from the homomorphisms, okay. that is the natural way to actually get ideals. So, if I have a map, let us say linear uh, map which is also Lie homomorphism from G to G dash, okay. let us say phi is actually a Lie homomorphism. So, then what we do? We look at what is called the kernel of this map. Okay. So, the kernel of this map makes sense as a linear map. So, what is this kernel? So, this is uh, called kernel of the map phi. So, this is those elements in G such that so those are mapped to 0 via this map phi. Okay. So, this is uh, indeed a subspace of this G. Okay. So, now let us see what happens if we assume this phi is uh, Lie homomorphism and whether we can get any extra property uh, about this kernel. Okay. So first of all, uh, one can ask whether this kernel is actually a subalgebra or not. So, let us see whether it is a subalgebra. So, let us start with uh, two elements from this kernel. So, let x, y uh, from this kernel phi. So, then uh, what we want to uh, want to see whether the bracket of x y whether it is in kernel of phi or not. So, then let us compute what is the bracket of x y under this map. So, then since this phi is actually a Lie algebra homomorphism you can see that this is nothing but phi of x phi of y bracket of that. So, then since phi of x phi, phi of y both are 0. So, this implies uh, this uh, map uh, phi of bracket x y is 0. Okay. That implies the bracket x y is indeed inside the kernel of phi. So, that is what we need wanted to show. So, now uh, more than this uh, actually uh, you can see from this equation if one of this phi of x or phi of y is 0. So, then uh, the bracket is going to be 0. So, that means you can assume this x is coming from the Lie algebra G and y is coming from kernel phi, but still we will have the bracket x y is in kernel phi. Okay. What I am saying suppose if x is in G and y is in kernel phi, then still we get the bracket of x y is 0 under the map phi, phi of bracket x y is 0. So, what does it mean? That means we still have this bracket x y is in the kernel. Okay. So, this property is actually very, very important property. So, this actually kind of duplicates uh, the property that you have seen in the ring theory where the product is just assumed to be associative uh, product, okay. but here the product is general product, but still uh, this thing holds. Okay. The, the product between x and y is in, in this kernel phi for all x in G and y is in kernel phi. If uh, this property is what uh, very important property for the kernel, okay. so we will isolate this property and we call a subspace satisfying this property as an ideal. Okay. So, what is the definition of ideal? So, you start with a subspace, okay. a subspace i of g is said to be ideal if the following holds. Okay. What holds? So, whenever you take x from g and y from i. 
So, then the bracket of this x y should be in i. Okay, so, that is the property. If I if your subspace satisfies this property, then we call this is an ideal. It is immediate that ideals are subalgebras. Okay. So, it is easy to see ideals must be subalgebras. Okay. We also have seen from the previous uh, discussion kernel of any Lie homomorphism is an ideal. Okay. So, indeed we will see that uh, any ideal will be actually arising as kernel of some Lie homomorphism. So, for that uh, we need to actually introduce uh, what is called this quotient algebra which is actually a new way of getting uh, Lie algebras from existing Lie algebras. Okay. It is a procedure uh, to get uh, more interesting classes of Lie algebras from already known Lie algebras. So, we will that we will do that in a minute, but before that I would like to give some examples of this ideals okay, and uh, we will also see some elementary properties of this ideals. Okay. So, let us uh, see some examples. So, If we actually take uh, uh, this abelian Lie algebra, let us say G is abelian Lie algebra. So, then any subspace will be actually ideal inside abelian Lie algebra. So, then any subspace I of G is an ideal of G. Okay, that is easy to see because all the Lie products are trivial. Okay, so, that, that says any uh, subspace becomes ideal. So, now uh, let us take our favorite example for example, general linear Lie algebra. So, G L N of C. So, then I would say like uh, now consider this S L and C sitting inside G L and C. So, then it is easy to see this S L and C is an ideal inside G L and C. Okay. So, S L and C is an ideal of G L and C. So, why this is true? Suppose, if you start with uh, some matrix A in G L and C and then some matrix B in S L and C. So, then what will happen to the commutator? The commutator is nothing but A B minus B A. Now, if you compute the trace for the commutator, then that will be the trace of A B minus B A which will be 0. Okay. So, that implies for any A in G L and C, B in S L and C, the bracket A B always lies inside S L and C. Okay. So, that means the property star is satisfied. So, S L and C is an ideal. So, uh, before actually moving forward, I want to give you a warning. So, in general ring theory, we talk about left ideal and right ideal uh, because uh, we will not assume anything like uh, commutativity about uh, the product. Okay. But uh, even though we do not have commutativity here in the Lie product, still we do not care about this left and right ideals because left ideals will become right ideals and uh, they also become two sided ideals using skew symmetric. So, since we have this skew symmetric bracket x y is same as bracket y x. So, that implies left ideals are same as right ideals and that same as two sided ideals. So, if we do not distinguish between uh, this left right or two sided ideals. Okay. We will only talk about ideals in Lie theory. So, now uh, let us uh, move on. Okay. So, now what we want to do okay, given ideals we will see how to make some new ideals out of it. Okay. Let us say I and J are two ideals of G. 
So then immediately what one can do, one can one can actually talk about the intersection of i and j. Okay. So this is those elements in G such that x is in i as well as x is in j. So it is easy to see that uh, the intersection of uh, these two ideals must be again ideal. Okay. So this is again an ideal in G. So it is easy to see that intersection of subspaces is again a subspace. So now uh, what we need to prove suppose uh, uh, if x is in G and y is in the intersection then we need to prove that the bracket x y should be in the intersection. Okay, But that is obvious because once we have x is in G and y is in I intersection J. So that will imply the bracket x y will be in I by using the definition of ideal for I and that same argument will tell you bracket x y is in J. So that will imply that x bracket y that is actually inside I intersection J. Okay. So this says that uh, I intersection J must be an ideal for for any ideals i and j and this is uh, not only true for only two ideals. So, this arguments will hold for any intersection of uh, like any family of ideals. Okay. So, that I will leave it as exercise. So, now given these two ideals uh, we can also make uh, uh, one new space called the sum of these two ideals. Okay. So, what we can do given this two subspaces i and j we can talk about i plus j which is the sum of these two spaces by definition you add all possible elements from i and j. So then it is easy to see that uh, i plus j is again a subspace of g. So now we claim that it is indeed ideal. So, i plus j is an ideal of g. Okay. So, that is again like not very difficult to see. So, what we need to prove? So, we start with some x in g and then some y in i plus j. Okay. So, then we need to prove that the bracket x y is in actually i plus j. But note that since this y is in inside i plus j, so the y is of the form some z1 plus z2 for some z1 is in i and then z2 is in j. So now if you take the bracket with x then what will happen this will be actually split into x z1 plus x z2. But note that x is in g and z1 is in i. So, this is in g, this is in i. So, that means the bracket will be in i. For similar reason this x is in g and then this z2 is, is in uh, j. So, that implies that this bracket is in j. So, that implies this bracket x y which is sum of two elements first one is in i and the second one second elements in j so then this will be this will lie inside i plus j so that proves that uh, the bracket of uh, this xy is in i plus j so that means i plus j is an ideal so just to use some shorthand notation whenever i say i is an ideal in g i just use this uh, triangle to denote this okay so so this means i is an ideal of g okay so now here is one interesting uh, actually construction so this is called product of ideal okay so this i plus j so this is called the sum of ideals 
okay. So, now we can talk about what is called product of ideals. So, what is this? So, you just uh, denote this by bracket ij. So, what is this bracket ij? You take it to be the span of all this bracket x y where x is coming from i and y is coming from j. Okay. So, now what we claim? We claim that so this is again is an ideal. So, this is ideal inside j. Okay. So, here we need to be little bit careful because the typical element in bracket ij will be combination of all these uh, products x y. Okay. So, in particularly if we take uh, x in g and some y in this bracket ij. So, then we can write this y as sum of some x i e z i. Okay, where I range from 1 to n and where this all this x i's they come from this capital I and all this e z i's they come from capital J. Okay. So, now what we need to prove? We need to compute the bracket x y. So, let us compute and then see what happens. The bracket x y is nothing but summation i range from 1 to n bracket x bracket x i e z i. Okay. But now you can see that uh, this is nothing but summation i range from 1 to n using the Jacobi identity. This is bracket x x i e z i plus bracket x i x e z i. Okay. So, now look at this element. Since this x i is in capital I, this x is in G. So, this uh, bracket will lie inside i okay. and then this is inside j. Similarly, this lies inside uh, j and then this lies inside i. So, again this is commutator of two elements coming from like one from i another one from j. Similarly, here commutator of one element coming from i another element coming from j. So, this is of this form. So, again so this bracket x y is written as combination of elements of the form bracket uh, x y where x is coming from i and y is coming from j. So, that implies this uh, bracket x y is in the bracket i comma j. Okay. So, this proves that uh, this bracket x i comma j is an actually ideal. So, now uh, uh, I want to give you a slight warning. Okay. So, the warning is we need to have the span of bracket x y. Okay. So, we cannot avoid the span in the definition of the product bracket i j. What is the meaning of that? So, I cannot simply define the bracket of i j to be just the set bracket x y where x in coming from i and y coming from j. That actually will not be ideal again. Okay. So, I cannot give you an example right now. I will add that in the problem sheet. Okay. So, one has to actually work over real numbers to get such examples. But anyway, there is a very interesting question that actually pops up from this uh, observation. So, I will actually, so I will just write down what I said. So, we cannot define bracket i j to be just bracket x y x coming from i and y coming from j. Okay. So, this is actually wrong. So, you should think about it and actually there are counter examples where this thing this set even will not even become ideal. Okay. So, now uh, here is the interesting question actually once you actually think about uh, writing something in terms of this brackets. Okay. 
So, since this discussion came here, I am just writing this uh, uh, question here. So, here is the question. The question is, so we have defined a bracket, Lie bracket on G, okay. So, one can actually uh, ask this question for even uh, subspaces or subalgebras or ideals and so on, but let us ask this question even for uh, Lie algebra itself. So, you have uh, this Lie bracket from G cross G to G, okay. So, now the question is, so what this uh, map, uh, map does, this map does given x y it maps to bracket x y, okay, that is all it does and this is a bilinear map and this is actually Lie bracket. So, now what is the question? The question is when this map is surject, okay. So, that is very legitimate question or can you like uh, specify some classes of Lie algebras? one can ask whether this map is surjective or not for that classes of Lie algebras and uh, some lot, lots of research is actually done do in that direction, okay. As an example, I will just give you uh, one exercise, okay. So, that exercise is actually going to answer this for SLNC. Suppose, if you take uh, uh, SLNC, so then the, the answer to this question is affirmative. That means, so, I will write in very detail, okay. given any matrix Ej inside G, so that is means it is just a traceless matrix. Okay. So, then there exist some x and y again inside S L and C such that this Ej can be written as bracket x y. Okay. So, this is not uh, that easy. Uh, easy fact that uh, one one expects okay but this can be proved and i will leave it as exercise for you to think about it this is very interesting exercise okay and uh, that means if any element in slnc is actually simple commutator that's what it says okay so these kind of uh, lee products you can call it like simple products or simple lee products or simple commutators. So, each element of SLNC can be written. So, this is actually true even for any element of okay, like uh, JLNC. So, that is not uh, hard to see. Again, you take traceless matrix. Uh, so, to get this condition, you need to start with traceless matrix because trace of co any commutator bracket x y must be 0. Okay. So, basically what it says, this say this exercise can be rephrased as follows. Suppose A is a matrix, then A is actually traceless if and only if A can be written as B C for some B C coming from M R C. Actually, here I am I am doing something more. Okay, so this is we are here we are demanding X and Y to be traceless again. Okay in this uh, in this uh, first question uh, but in the part b we are not demanding that okay so it is actually somewhat simpler version but still you can you will be able to do this okay because a is harder than b okay so this is just aside i just wanted to give you this uh, small exercise so now uh, let's go back to uh, what we have what we have been doing okay i defined uh, the product between two ideals so now uh, what we can do we can also talk about uh, a product uh, of this g itself okay so i and j we can take it to be g then uh, we can talk about the product of that okay so what it is actually so that in that special case we call this as the derived algebra Okay. So, this is called the derived algebra and it is uh, uh, easy to see because from the, our earlier proof, uh, this derived algebra is an ideal inside G. Okay. And uh, here is a small observation is G is abelian if and only if 
this derived algebra is just 0. Okay. So, this is a largest uh, subspace uh, in, in some sense this is a derived algebra is actually uh, does the role of this commutator subgroup of uh, some commutator subgroup of a group okay? that, that is the role it exactly does. So, here is uh, one exercise. So, now uh, once we have defined uh, the notion of derived algebra then uh, one can ask okay, derived algebra of various uh, known uh, Lie algebras. For example, compute okay. So, de compute the derived algebras of G where G is GLNC, C, S L N C and uh, like B and C and N and C. Okay. So, these are all the examples that we have seen. So, you can actually try to compute. For example, uh, it is not uh, hard to prove okay. when you take the derived algebra of S L and C then you get back S L and C. So, this is something you can verify. Okay, maybe I will do it during the problem solving session. Okay, this is all about uh, product of ideals and uh, sum of ideals and so on. So, the, these are all the ways one can actually get uh, some new ideals. Uh, now, uh, given these ideals, uh, we want to actually construct some new Lie algebras okay, called quotient algebras. So, these quotient algebras is actually a procedure to get uh, new Lie algebras from old Lie algebras and then let us see how one actually gets that. So, all of you must know what is quotient space from uh, first course in uh, Lie algebra, uh, linear algebras. Okay. So, that I am not going to actually really recall, but anyway I will tell you what is the quotient space definition and then we can go from that. So, how do I how do I construct this quotient algebra? Okay. So, you start with Lie algebra as before, okay. let uh, G be a Lie algebra over complex numbers and then let us say i is an ideal in SIG, Okay. Then one can because it is a subspace one can immediately talk about what is called this quotient space. So, this is just a quotient space. So, what is this quotient space by definition? You take all these uh, cosets corresponding to uh, this subspace i. Okay. Basically, you define a equivalence relation. Okay. You define an equivalence relation on G with respect to this surface i and then you take all possible equivalence classes with respect to that equivalence relation, then you get these classes as uh, this following cosets which are all nothing but translation of this i. Okay. I will just write down all these cosets, I am not going to recall what this equivalence relation and so on, but it is obvious that once I give you uh, these cosets then it is also like equivalent to giving the equivalence relation. So, what are all these uh, cosets these are all nothing but the translation of all this uh, translation of uh, uh, this capital I where is it is coming from G. Okay. So, you must have seen in elementary linear algebra this is actually a vector space again over complex numbers. How the addition is defined? So, you can actually add two cosets by adding some representatives you call z1 is representative z2 is representative from the second coset then you just add it by adding them and then taking the corresponding coset and it is easy to see this is actually a well defined addition on g modulo i similar to that you also have scalar multiplication suppose alpha in alpha I coming from complex numbers and then this e z plus i is an element of g mod i then what is the product alpha e z plus i. So, this is the scalar product which is defined to be 
alpha is at plus i okay we use uh, the scalar product the scalar multiplication and the addition that are already available in the ambient space to define uh, addition and uh, scalar product for this quotient space okay and i will leave it to you to check both of these uh, are well defined operation on g modulo i and then with respect to this addition and uh, scalar multiplication this g modulo i becomes vector space over complex numbers okay so g mod i is a vector space over complex numbers so that is something we know already so now what we want to do we just want to define leap product on g mod i we already have a leap product on g so we will be using that leap product okay so you take two elements and then just to define its leap product to be so you use the leap product that you have already in g and then take the corresponding coset okay so this is the natural definition that one expects so you just use that to define this okay now here is the question the question is whether this product is well defined or not okay even when you do this uh, ring theory and all when you start with uh, two sided ideal and go modulo that and then you will be able to define product there you have this question whether that is an again well defined product or not similar to that we ask this question here so let us verify this is indeed well defined product for that okay we just choose two different representatives and then see whether what what you get okay suppose x plus i is equal to x dash plus i and y plus i is equal to y dash plus i that means these two cosets are equal so we have two different representatives for first coset and for the second coset again we have two different representatives so then we just uh, want to say if i take this bracket x y plus i that should be same as the bracket x dash y dash plus i so which is equivalent to saying that okay this is equivalent to saying that the bracket x y minus the bracket x dash y dash that should be in i okay so it is uh, you know already by definition x plus i equal to x dash plus i if and only if x minus x dash will be in i okay this is the definition of two cosets being equal okay so because of that we need to verify whether this is true or not okay this is the what we need to verify so let us verify whether this is true and then if we verify then this gives you well defined leap product okay so let us do the calculation we already know that x minus x dash is in i similarly y minus y dash in i so now what we need to prove we need to prove that the bracket uh, uh, x y minus x dash y dash is in i okay let us do this computation you compute bracket x y now what we can do we can just add and subtract x dash and then here again you can add and subtract y dash okay so if you do that then if you just use this linearity then what do you get you get uh, bracket x minus x dash comma y minus y dash plus y dash okay uh, plus x dash okay i don't use this comma maybe i will address so this is x dash y minus y dash plus y dash so note that this x minus x dash is in i okay so that means this element this is in i okay so now if you take this second element what is what is happening because we want to do it modulo i na so this is some uh, some element let me call this is uh, xi so this is xi plus x dash sorry x dash uh, y minus y dash 
plus x dash y dash ok. So, you can see that since this y y dash is in i this entire element is in i ok. So, that means, so this is uh, some xi, xi dash so that is also in i. So, this is you wrote it as bracket x y equal to psi plus xi dash plus x dash y dash both xi, xi dash both are in i. So, that will imply xi plus xi dash is in i. So, that means this bracket x y minus x dash y dash. So, this is in i ok. So, that proves that uh, the bracket that we defined is actually well defined. Okay. So, that means uh, the bracket uh, is well defined. Now, I just leave it to you to check this bracket is indeed uh, gives you bilinear map because this is induced from the bilinear map this has to be bilinear. So, that is the reason and then uh, since it satisfies skew symmetric and, uh, and the original bracket that is uh, actually satisfying skew symmetric and Jacobi identity. So, this induced bracket will also satisfy uh, skew symmetric and uh, Jacobi identity ok. For example, if you want to just define uh, uh, if you want to just check uh, skew symmetric here is the proof. So, you take x plus i and then x plus i. So, then the bracket will be bracket x x plus i which is 0. So, you get 0. 0 plus i which is 0 inside g border y. So, similarly I will leave it to you check Jacobi identity satisfied by this product ok. So, that makes now this as uh, Lie algebra ok. You have this uh, g mod i with this uh, new product ok which is induced from g. So, that makes it uh, Lie algebra ok. So, this is uh, one way to actually get uh, some interesting Lie algebra. So, you can actually like as an example let us see we already have some homomorphism uh, from earlier lectures we will just see uh, what will be the quotient using that ok. Uh, because the uh, the kernel of that homomorphism will be ideal. So, that actually kind of tells us uh, somewhat how to handle the quotient. So, that is all like uh, kind of we can get information about this quotient algebra using what is called isomorphism theorems. I will actually prove uh, in uh, prove those isomorphism theorem in the next lecture ok. But before that let us just see like uh, some uh, basic properties of this quotient algebras ok. So, there is a there is this natural map ok from this g to g modulo i. So, which is called the quotient map ok. What is this map? Let me call it pi. So, this takes x to x plus i. So, this is a natural uh, linear map c linear map from g to g modulo i. So, this uh, map is actually uh, it is easy to check it is C linear ok because uh, this G model I is quotient space this is indeed actually Lie homomorphism. So, that also one can check. So, because that is obvious from the bracket ok. So, what what does it mean by it is a Lie, Lie homomorphism you take bracket of x y and then look at the image of that then that should be bracket of pi of x pi of y ok. But what is pi of x y? Pi of x y is nothing but bracket x y plus i. So, but that is by definition is x plus i comma y plus i. So, which is nothing but bracket pi x pi y ok. So, that way you, you verify that this uh, quotient map which is the natural map ok. This is called quotient map. is actually naturally a Lie homomorphism. Then what will be the kernel of this map? So, it is not hard to see the kernel of this map will be just i ok. So, that is not very hard because what is the kernel by definition? 
the kernel by definition those x in g such that when you look at pi of x that should be 0, but what is that by definition this is those x in g such that x plus i should be 0, but x plus i should be 0 is same as x plus i should be i. So, that means this is those x in g such that x is in i okay, that is why this is i. So, the kernel pi is nothing but i. So, now uh, look at okay, uh, some more informations. Uh, if I start with some ideal okay, that contains i, so let us say j is an ideal of g that also contains i. So, then uh, what happens i becomes okay, i assume i or i is also ideal. Okay. So, let me rewrite. So, i is ideal inside g, let us say i contains in j, j is also ideal in g. Okay. So, now you can ask this question okay, what will happen to the image of this j. Okay. So, you have this quotient map from g to g modulo i. Okay. So, then what is the image? So, the image is nothing but all possible x plus i such that x is coming from j. So, in shorthand notation one can just, just write this as j modulo i. So, there is no harm in that, but now the question is since j is an ideal inside g can we say something more about this j. Okay. So, actually one can claim this j mod i must be an ideal. Okay. So, what is what is the claim? The claim is j modulo i is an ideal inside g modulo i. So, how one verify this? You start with some element x plus i inside g modulo i and then y plus i inside j modulo i. So, then you look at the bracket okay, x plus i y plus i. So, then what happens this will give you x y plus i, but what we need to prove we need to prove this x bracket x y plus i should be in j mod i, but the thing is x is coming from g and y is coming from j okay, because y plus i will be equal to okay, y plus i will be equal to y dash plus i okay, for some y dash is coming from j. So, that will say this y minus y dash should be inside i okay, which is subset of j. So, that will imply y is in j. Okay. So, that means I can assume this y is coming from j. So, because x is in g y is in j. So, that already implies bracket x y is in j because j is an idea. So, that means that means if I take bracket x y plus i, so that is inside j mod i. Okay. So, that verifies that uh, this entire term is inside j mod i. So, that means this is an ideal inside j mod i. Okay. So, this is actually a very important uh, observation. So, these observations will be used uh, later. Okay. So, actually I will continue with uh, this isomorphism theorems uh, later in the next class. So, right now I will stop. Thanks.